everyone. This is Peter Swidler. I'm doing the the after show for uh, uh, the the Chessable Masters prelims. But we're not really limited to only talking about the Chessable Masters prelims. I obviously there is the World Cup going on, which is a, another really big event uh, in the world right now. So if you have questions uh, uh, about that, I have uh, I have some games prepared to show you if you want to. And uh, generally speaking, I think I, I would very much welcome uh, as much audience participation as possible, frankly, because uh, it's been a, a, a long and trying day. And uh, if I am to spend uh, uh, most of this time just trying to, you know, talk on my own, I think uh, uh, I might get uh, I might get repetitive, and I will probably not make too much sense. So. I would really appreciate it if you uh, uh, if you asked me questions and kind of generally directed me towards things you uh, you want me to talk about. But I do have some material prepared, which um, uh, which I can rely uh, rely on. Uh, so we'll start with the uh, we'll start with the chessable masters. I assume uh, most of you uh, uh, will have watched the uh, the official broadcast or some broadcast dealing uh, uh dealing with what went on today uh there is currently absolutely no shortage of really really top notch people talking about all things chess related on uh on twitch and elsewhere so uh i think all of us are <laughs> what's up yo yeah uh something definitely is up somewhere in the world uh So I mean, it's it's a very nice time to be uh, to be following chess events because there is just so much uh, material available, so so much good commentary, so much excellent post game analysis. So I think uh, it's it's an excellent time to either you know take up chess or return to chess after a break or continue you know being interested in chess. Um, as for, as, as I said, as for Chessable Masters uh, itself, um, the games are still going on on my other screen. I can see that Alireza is uh, is still torturing the young man a little bit. He, the position he has should be completely winning, but I assume there are maybe some technical issues. So he is now sort of working out the kinks of you know exactly how to convert this into a full point. I thought I saw a very simple plan for for him. Unfortunately, I can't import. Uh, a, a live game. I, I do have some games imported, but I can't import the live game. I could maybe, as we as we speak, I could maybe like risk something and try to try to set a position up uh, live. This is uh, you know first time on Twitch.tv. Peter Swidler tries to do something uh, on live broadcast that he's never done before. This probably will backfire spectacularly, but. Um, uh, let's see if I will succeed. So the position they had was uh, something like this. Uh, you, you you can't see it yet, but I'll I'll finish setting it up in a moment and I'll I'll bring it up. White to move, yeah. White to move. Safe changes. I hope you can see it. Let me know. Let me know if you can see it. They've also had this slightly earlier, very similar. Uh, a very similar type of situation, and uh, I thought the easiest way to win this would be uh, via Tsukzwang. You can play rook a6 here. It's not required, but I thought it was very uh, very convenient. We've created a threat of f5, f6, so I'm assuming black has to play king e7. Now we give this check. The king goes to f8, and this is a position Alireza could have had earlier as well, so it's not the first time he could have gotten here. And now we go rook e1. And I think uh, black just resigns because king g8 allows mate in one. The bishop cannot go to c1 because we took that square away. Next move, we pick up the pawn on a3. And without the pawn on a3, I think, you know, it's really kind of understandable that you don't have, you know, any reason to continue. But Alireza won that game anyway, so it's not criticism. I just wanted to start with something nice and easy to, you know, get us... Uh, get us warmed up. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of tournament intrigue, uh, uh, in terms of tournament intrigue, uh, there is definitely, uh, 
there's definitely uh, been uh, uh, Champions Tour events which were more unpredictable going into the final round. I actually went to the, like, I don't want to uh, overstate how heroic I am in, in my preparation for this lecture, but I did make some screenshots of uh, the uh, tournament cross table after, let's say, rounds 13 and 14, just to have a kind of a reference frame for uh, the people who were in the running. But there were no huge surprises. And, you know, the people who were sort of qualifying by round 13, I think, did end up qualifying. I will now, I think all the games are finished. I will take a look at who took which place. I think this is now decided. And this also decides the pairings. But the eight people who qualified looked like qualifying after round 13. They also looked like qualifying after round uh, 14. There was one potential storyline there in round 15. Uh, Wesley Saw was playing against uh, Jordan Van Forest. And uh, had Wesley won that game, and uh, he, he won the tournament very comfortably and was in no risk in terms of his own uh, placement, uh, it would have given a chance for Adiban uh, to uh, to qualify with a victory. Uh, but Wesley, as he often does when he is completely cruising and doesn't really need anything in the tournament anymore, uh, Wesley took a very short draw against uh, Jordan, completely knocking out, uh, knocking out Adiban. And that did away with the last remaining bit of intrigue. Uh, that uh, that we had in this tournament. So the people qualifying are Wesley in first place, clear first on 11 out of 15. Uh, then there's a tie between Livon, uh, Alireza, and Hikaru on 10 and a half out of 15. I assume the Chess24 website has them uh, listed in the proper order. I don't know what I'm basing this assumption on, but this is what I'm going to assume. Uh, and then Artemiev in fifth. Uh, Lekwan and uh, Shachma Mijarov uh, in six and seven tied on nine out of 15, and Jordan uh, catching uh, catching the bus uh, on, on on eight and a half out of 15, which is, a, honestly, it's a very good result. There were some, I think, some tournaments where you could maybe even catch the last qualifying place on 50%, and definitely plus one used to be enough, uh, but Jordan scored plus two, so uh, very, very... Uh, decent finish for him. And I assume we are uh, going to see Wesley play Jordan uh, in the quarters. Levon will play uh, against Shah. Uh, Lequan will play against Ali Reza. And Hikaru plays uh, Vladislav Artemiev. So we have some very, so some very interesting pairings uh, uh, already. And uh, the people missing out, the notable pe people missing out are, I think, uh, uh, Adiban and Hare Krishna, who uh probably will will feel somewhat unhappy about not qualifying and uh that's probably everything we need to say about the technical results of this uh of this tournament and of course you know the 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 huge story of the tournament arguably uh the the, the story that uh, a lot of people kind of liked following uh the most maybe even more than this race to to qualify is uh, how the young men will do. Because this tournament is the first time we see uh, the youngest grandmaster in history, uh, Abhimanyu uh, Mishra, play uh, against this kind of a stellar field. And uh, uh, as a kind of a spoiler alert, he finally won a game today. And it was a very nice game. It featured a lot of uh, swings eventually. Like, it looked at some point that he will just win uh, a very convincing, very smooth game against a very strong grandmaster, and then it featured uh, a lot of swings and rounds about roundabout. Yeah, I can't speak English anymore. I've done five hours of World Cup coverage today, and <laughs> I I appear to be somewhat dying on my feet. Apologies, but I'll I'll, I'll persevere. Um, and then uh, Harry, who already had uh, a very nice position, slightly overpressed and got severely punished by by the young man on his last remaining seconds he played the sequence of very uh precise moves having like 10 seconds on the clock um so yeah that the his participation is um uh is definitely a a very interesting topic and uh i wanted to start by saying that 
I, I don't want to be critical and I, I don't know the young man at all. And it's really not my place to even sort of offer running commentary on this. But I wonder if uh, he and his family, who I assume still, you know, he's only 12, so I assume they take uh, a serious role in, uh, you know, managing and making admin decisions for him. Let's put it like this. I wonder if they actually considered saying no to the invite. Uh, because, you know, as someone who probably said no to maybe one invite in my entire life, I feel kind of fake even suggesting that. Uh, it's extremely, extremely difficult to to say no to an opportunity to play in such a such a stellar field. But I remember, uh, I don't know how many of you remember that storyline, but uh, the the German uh, young man Vincent Keimer uh, won a Grand Key Open one year, and that win, which was uh, a huge sensation at the time because he was, I think he was 14 at the time, and he won ahead of a field of tons of very strong well-established GMs. I don't think he was a grandmaster at the time even. And that win gave him uh, a qualifying place to play the Cranky Classic next year. And uh, he was immediately asked how he feels about the prospect of playing the Grand Key Classic in a year's time. And that was in a year's time. So he had plenty of time to prepare, get better, you know, hire coaches. He was already working with Peter Lecco and I, I spoke to Peter Lecco about him. And one of the things Peter told me was that he is a very, very uh, mature young man and, you know, takes life in, in, in the right way. He doesn't, you know, necessarily believe the overhype that followed uh, his victory in the open. And I think he replied that he will set himself some goals for that year. And if he actually fulfills those goals, and if he feels he is ready, he will play the he will play the classic. And if he doesn't, if he if he if if by the time the year rolls on, he feels he's still a little bit too fresh, a little bit too uh, green, uh, he will gratefully say thanks for the invite, but I will I will try to qualify again at some point in the future. And he ended up playing, he actually played the year I played in the Granky Classic, the only Granky Classic I ever played. And he didn't score very many points, but he looked like a very promising uh, promising player. And he definitely, with, with slightly better luck, with slightly better run of, run of results, he could have, uh, he could have done uh, quite well there. So he, he took that decision. But it's a, it's a conversation I think that is, it's very much dependent on uh, how well he himself and his family uh, believe he deals with with, with setbacks. Uh, because, yeah, he definitely, I mean, I, he should have beaten me in that tournament. I, I have absolutely no intention of disrespecting Vincent. And I'm, I also am not, I hope you don't take this as disrespect towards Mishra. Uh, it's just that... Uh, Losing game after game after game for three days straight is potentially a traumatic experience uh, coming off from the incredible high of getting the title in time and becoming the, the, the youngest ever and getting the record. Uh, but you, you absolutely, I think, have to weigh what it will die, what, what, what it will do to him psychologically. Uh, and if they know him well, I, I assume they know him well enough, and I assume he himself understands how he deals with things in life well enough. Because obviously this is unbelievably important uh, in terms of gaining experience. Getting to play 15 games against this field uh, will do him a world of good as long as you know he doesn't become dispirited by the, by the results, for instance. I don't think he should. I think... You know, he had a lot of very good positions. Uh, if he converted all the good positions he had in this tournament, he would have been on. I, I, I don't want to say he would be, you know, fighting for qualification. That's probably an overstatement. But he would be somewhere in the middle of the pack if he converted all the good positions. Obviously, this is not how this works. You know, you can't bank expected value in chess. You can't say, you know, I had 
I had so many like plus three positions. Please, you know, add me some points in the final scoring. This is not not how things work, of course. But uh, I I don't think his performance is bad or anything. It's just that I think you have to at least ask yourself. Uh, I think you you have to at least ask yourself if uh, perhaps uh, you know this experience is not entirely positive because nobody likes losing. I don't think you get entirely used to losing even after playing the game professionally for like 35 years. Uh, so it's it's at least something that I wanted to bring up because it 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 was a curious question that I asked myself today. Uh, I as a, as a parent of uh, two two boys who never played chess so i never had to face exactly that situation but i i had to face situations which are somewhat relatable to this and i i i became curious as to like how do you approach this as a parent in particular uh because from a purely chess perspective of course you have to play he got to play against the absolute best in the world results really don't matter there's a very long career ahead of him uh However many points he scores in this tournament, it's still unbelievably valuable experience. But you know, it might it might be somewhat damaging in the short term psychologically. So yeah, it's just it's just a topic that came to my mind. I don't know. Like maybe I'm completely wrong, and maybe this decision should really take like three seconds because of how beneficial it is to you from a from a purely chess perspective. But um, it's it's just something that I wanted to bring up because it was yeah I thought it was a curious like thought experiment and you know an attempt to put put myself in 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 his parents in particular shoes yeah and uh, pe uh, people saying in chat that this is what some people said when Nigel Short had a terrible tournament and as a fourteen year old uh, at some point this becomes much less of a consideration but I think. Honestly, there is a big difference between 12 and 14 to begin with. Uh, I think uh, every year uh, for kids as young as this makes them like it's 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 a long time. Uh, a 12 year old and a 14 year old are uh, you know, potentially very very uh, different psychologically. The make the psychological makeup, the amount of experience you already have, is quite different. So uh, yeah, I once again I'm very prepared to to say you to to accept that what i'm saying is completely wrong and uh uh and it it's never really it's never really a, a choice you absolutely have to and probably yes probably yes you do have to but i do think it's probably not a three second decision it's probably a decision that gets discussed uh you know between him and his family and they do come to the to the answer that came, that they came to um and yeah, uh, Spiral92 saying, I think there is also a difference between losing and being crushed without any chance. Uh, yeah, and he, he clearly is good enough to, to give many of these guys a very decent game. And he could have won much more than the one game he won. Once again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying he's a, he is a poor player at all. He is clearly an ext extremely talented young man. That sort of goes without saying. We, we kind of... Uh, we have to assume that this is the starting point. We know he is very good and will get better. So it's it's just a question of uh, how traumatic you you assume this experience might be. Uh, but you probably still play uh, because, as I said, uh, an opportunity to play against such strong opposition doesn't come every day. Uh, all right, I think I I probably bored you with my you know, psycho bubble for long enough. So let's uh, maybe move some pieces around. Uh, I assume you can see the board. It's currently a starting position. And I wanted to start, uh, some of you who are, <clears throat> uh, I was just watching uh, his interview after the, the term and he seemed on top of the world about his, but yeah, that's very good. Then like all of my, all of my concerns are completely misplaced. And I'm very happy about it, honestly. I, it's not like I'm rooting for him for him to, to have a very bad experience. Obviously, like if he takes it in the right way, if he takes it as a 
as you know something that uh, you know will 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 give him a chance to play against the best of the best and uh, you can you can bank that experience and learn from it then you know more power to him and uh, he played well he he clearly is not used to this level of resistance i think against slightly weaker players uh, who ask fewer questions, he would have scored a ton more points from the same position. Um, so yeah, uh, as for moving the pieces around, I wanted to start with a game which I assume you will have seen, and I want to show you this game more or less specifically for you know the one moment in it, which you may have seen on Twitter if you are, although I think very few people uh, you know follow all kinds of you know, specialized Twitter as as closely as I do, so you probably will have missed it. Uh, and it's it's actually a Mishra game in the or from the first round of today against uh, against Adiban. I will do uh, I will do very very cursory uh, uh, notes on the opening because I don't think we really want to go uh, in too deep and as to what happened in the opening there. Uh, so uh, Mishra played the Nidorf against Adiban, which is, uh, I mean, you should play your own openings, but <clears throat> Adiban obviously is one of the mo more fierce uh, attackers in the world chess right now. So uh, it's also uh, a kind of a sign that uh, the young man really doesn't, uh, you know, not particularly concerned about playing to his opponent's strength. Which I think is good. I think uh, I think that's also a very positive thing to to observe. <clears throat> Adiban played the Sozin here, bishop c4, e6, bishop e3, b5. I have really no idea what's going on here. This move order is. Uh, I'm I'm not a huge Sozin specialist at the best of times, and already uh, bishop c4 followed by bishop b3 is kind of confusing to me. But b5 shouldn't be all that bad. Bishop b3, bishop b7, and there Adiban played something quite artificial. I thought queen f3, uh, queen c7. Now, of course, if white goes e5, uh, attacking the rook and the knight, black has bishop b7 here. And Adiban uh, kind of really went uh, a little bit off the rails here with g4, b4, knight e2, uh, bishop b7, uh, knight g3. Uh, and this looks sort of logical until you realize that black has an immediate way to strike at the white center here with d6 d5 and this is a kind of a dream situation you you really want to get out of the opening in any kind of a sicilian where you're the first one to launch a direct play uh, against your opponent's center and this is where uh you know uh as i look at this position right now uh and yeah welcome to the raiders uh thanks very much uh everyone and uh yeah i should probably actually open the give me give me one sec to open the, the twitch chat as well uh i feel somewhat naked without the, the twitch chat open um let me just mute it though somewhat naked. uh there we go um so yeah this position uh i didn't even want to particularly you know analyze it in any kind of depth because as i mentioned uh it's uh we're not going to be here for for, for too long and uh, for like a one hour conversation type type lecture i didn't really want to spend uh, i don't know half an hour explaining the intricacies of the the sozin to you guys but this is let's say in this position i try to think what i would do if i for some reason had this position with white myself i probably play uh g4 g5 here and then hope to somehow uh regardless of how black recaptures like we can get a position like this maybe and then castle long and maybe at some point we'll play g6 so knight takes a6 or g5 d4 we can play i don't know queen g2 and then once again try to castle and maybe play h4 and play something like this instead of all this adiban goes e5 a move i probably would have considered but a move that is already very committal because we're not opening any files for now, and this pawn will fall. You can already take it with the queen, or as the young man did, you can play knight d7, which is a very good move. And then Adiban continues throwing things uh, into the fire, like going knight gf5, going completely caveman style. And this is what he's famous for, and this is what he's extremely good at as well. You have to, uh, you have to, uh, like if you've watched him play at all at any point, uh, 
he does this whenever he he gets half an opportunity and he does this with great success as well it's not just you know that he loves sacrificing pieces for no reason it brings him great success because he is a very very good calculator and uh, just generally loves position like this you can't really let this knight leave so black took uh, Adiban played e6. And in this position, uh, 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 the young man uh, made a very big mistake. Uh, but Black is probably close to winning here. But the way Black is winning here is not very intuitive. The machine suggests you have to take uh, take play queen e5, uh, gf, and immediately challenge the knight on e6 using the fact that the bishop on e3 currently is pinned. So you can play knight of eight. And because the bishop cannot go anywhere to attack our queen due to the pin, we get to trade off the biggest attacker white has. And after that, we should be able to stabilize. And uh, we do have an extra piece, of course. Uh, or actually, not instead of knight c5, uh, uh, sorry, instead of knight of eight, knight c5 is even stronger. I'm kind of, for some reason, I'm trying to ad lib this instead of using my own notes, which is not very bright. Um, but, uh, uh, instead of all these moves, or you could also argue that uh, after after the movie six, I don't know uh, why it wouldn't let me. Um, let's scroll this way. You could also, uh, and this is something that like an experienced old folks like myself would be very tempted to do something like just castles and say, I understand you sacrificed the piece, but I am not contractually obliged to accept it. Uh, ed7, knight 97 now my king is safe, the f7 pawn is safe, knight takes f5, we can go bishop f6, <clears throat> uh, we want a5, a4, we want knight e5, knight c4, uh, and black probably is actually faster than white here, the machine doesn't like this for white at all. Uh, it's not obvious that this is great for black, but as, as a practical decision, in particular against somebody like Adiban, who uh, definitely prefers, you know, uh, attacking to defending, trying to switch the, uh, the switch sides here and trying to launch uh, some kind of an immediate counterattack is definitely uh, something you could consider. Uh, but Mishra played knight e5, and this already, although it looks very logical, this already actually puts his position in grave jeopardy. Uh, white goes ef, uh, knight takes f7, and here uh, the, the heartless machine suggests that the move Adiban played, which is knight e6, uh, obvious and natural as it looks, is actually not the strongest. And if you start by castling, Black's position is very, very bad because uh, we've, we've uh, evacuated the king uh, away from the center. Uh, Black's pieces are completely disorganized. Knight e6 will remain a threat for the next move. Knight takes a five is a threat for the next move now. And there's really no way for Black to uh, you know, properly uh, get his uh, ducks in a row here. And white is already much better. But instead, Adiban played knight e6, uh, Mishra played queen e5, which is the right move, gf. We've seen this position, we've seen a similar position earlier with a knight on d7, where knight c5 is uh, quite strong. Uh, but also, of course, there is no pawn on f5. This is the, this is the big difference compared to the position we were discussing earlier. No, there, actually, actually, that's not true. There was a pawn on f5 there. Uh, but playing knight c5 is a lot stronger. But even here, you absolutely have uh, to go after the knight on uh, e6. And black should have played knight d8 here. After knight d8, the game is still unclear, although white probably is doing quite well after long, long castles. But we are finally coming to the position uh, that... Why not knight g5? I think knight g5 is, uh, is also playable. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me show this on the board. After knight g5... Uh, I think what he disliked is probably white has the option of taking, taking, and then playing queen h5 check and picking the bishop up. But yeah, it's it's good that you spotted the uh, the idea. It probably doesn't work uh, tactically, but the idea definitely exists. Um, but we're we're coming uh, ever closer to the to the reason I brought this entire game up, and it's just one diagram. Uh, uh, Mishra played knight d6. Hang on a second. Mishra played knight d6 here. Uh, Adiban castled long. And Mishra played d5, d4. And uh, if you haven't seen this position, and if you haven't, in particular, if you haven't seen it with the engine switched on, uh, it's a kind of a, you know, advanced level puzzle. So I'm not, I'm only going to give you a minute 
uh, and you know, uh, I I don't know whether I'm supposed to expect many or few or none of you to get this right, but the the solution here is unbelievably beautiful. And I'll I'll make a quiz and I'll give you maybe actually more than a minute. Let's give you a, a minute and a half. Uh, so quiz. Uh, sorry, no, no, hang on. Uh, let me, uh, let me do this again because I, I gave, uh, I gave you too, too, too little time. Yeah. Let's go 90 seconds, <clears throat> white to move. And, uh, there we go. Um, and, uh, actually, uh, Round one started, and this is from round one of today, round 11, I mean. Um, uh, I was still doing commentary for uh, the World Cup. <clears throat> and uh, I, I uh, opened the tab for... Uh, I opened the tab for the, chessable, uh, for the Chessable Masters just to kind of try and keep some eye on the proceedings, knowing that I will have to do this later, later in the day. And basically, this diagram greeted me the moment I opened the tab because I, I gave the round some time to start and run. And there is no way I would have spotted the correct decision myself, but I did see the engine suggested. And uh, it's one of the more sort of striking and beautiful things I've seen in a while in a, in a live game. <clears throat> and there's already a, a, a number of uh, correct answers. Uh, also some incorrect answers, but yeah, there, there are some people who either are extremely good at chess or perhaps have also <laughs> seen the same thing that I did. Because, like, honestly, uh, the way I would have solved this is if somebody, like, gave me the exact same speech that I just gave you. Like, if you give me this position and say there is a solution here and it's unlike anything you've seen in a long time, then maybe, maybe there's a chance you solve it. But... In the practical game, it's very, very difficult to blame Adiban for not playing what you're supposed to play. Uh, so there are some Queen H5 check suggestions here. There are some Knight C7 check suggestions here. All of this is kind of, you know, normal sane moves which do something, but they don't do what you're supposed to do here. I'm not going to uh, go through uh, the reasons why they don't. I assume Queen H5 check, for instance, allows G7, G6, and you cannot take because the Queen is hanging. Uh, Knight c7 check uh, instead uh, allows king d8, and now our queen is hanging and the knight is hanging. And if we try to take it back, even queen takes e6 as, exists as a move because the queen is hanging. And the solution, uh, as uh, a number of you, uh, Capybar, Chessable Masters, uh, Shahmaste01, uh, uh, Al Tablerone, uh, Ali, uh, Alison uh, Alives, uh, the Super Fluty, and uh, uh, Quachi Ninja, uh, so Yala, I don't know. I, I just like ninjas, I guess. Uh, the solution here is the absolutely fabulous move queen takes b7. Just killing the bishop stone dead, uh, knight takes b7, and then we go bishop takes d4. Uh, and for a second there, white has uh, two pawns for the queen. This is a material balance. Uh, yeah, and uh, I, I also have the Twitch chat open. And yeah, Queen H5, G6, FG does exist. But in the final position, you are... What you're doing there, uh, Pikaya, is just winning the queen back. And, but you are starting from a piece down position. So you're not that happy about having to, to win the queen back there. But going back to... Um, hang on a second. Let me, let, me do, let me do better with this. Um, uh, going back to this position... Uh, we currently, as I mentioned, have uh, two pawns for the queen. Uh, but the queen has no good moves to go at all. Of course, you can't take on f5 because knight takes g7. Uh, you also cannot go to b5 because of knight c7 check. If you go to e4, uh, I think, I didn't even check, but I think what happens here is why it starts by bishop takes g7, which looks like we're just attacking the rook on, h on h8. And then you notice that there is also a threat of knight c7 mate because the bishop on b3 controls this square. 
And then, if we want to, once Black somehow parries uh, the threat of knight c7 mate, we can also include rook h1 before picking up the rook on h8. And <clears throat> basically, wherever the queen goes, our complete dominance in the center here is such that uh, Black is more or less helpless. And as I said, those of you who did not solve this should not feel bad. There is also some people, uh, Supremo UG, UGH, and uh, uh, no, Adiban didn't play this. Roof Runner and uh, uh, Zut Noche and uh, uh, Queen takes H5. You've suggested uh, the move uh, Bishop H4 check, uh, which is actually something that Adiban played himself. And it's a, it's a reasonable move, uh, but it leads to unclear positions. Uh, Mishra played knight d7, queen h5 check, g6, bishop takes d4. And uh, uh, in this position, uh, Mishra started going wrong, but uh, the, the machine suggests that you're supposed to play queen a5. And <laughs> I mean, it's one of those moves where, like, you see this recommendation and you think, uh, well, yeah, good luck not getting not getting uh, you know perma banned from every every chess website if you play this in a live game. It's not impossible to play this, but it's a kind of a move that you know uh, every everything inside you should scream, "I am getting made it! Please get some pieces off the board!" And instead, you're just calmly removing your queen from the uh, you know one avenue of attack and saying, you know, now your bishop on a4 is hanging together with everything else that was hanging previously, and there is no mate. I don't believe there is any mate in chess whatsoever. You know, do your worst. It's not an easy move to make. It's, uh, I don't think you can criticize uh, the young man for not making it. He took gh, uh, bishop e5, bishop h1, bishop h8. This position is better for white, but not lost yet, but it's difficult to play for black, and he made one more mistake in a few moves and lost. Uh, but that's kind of irrelevant. What I wanted to show you was specifically uh, specifically this position, queen b7, knight b7, and bishop d4, because I'm, I'm not overhyping this. When I, when I saw this on my screen, I thought, this is absolutely unbelievable. This, this makes you know, a perfect diagram for me to base my conversation with you, with you guys later in the day, because it's, it's unlike it's unlike most things. Very, very rarely you get positions with, with, with this material balance, which are this good for the side, which is down a queen. Yeah, very tall like there are there are some some tall games which are sort of like that. There are famous uh uh famous games against uh Hecht, I think, right? Uh but you know, in in with with similar material balance, but Tal already like had a pawn on g7, which was threatening to queen. Whereas here, we're just using the fact that we are completely controlling the entirety of the board. What if queen takes a6? I think you just kind of don't survive after bishop takes a6 because of how uh, poorly your pieces are placed. This is a threat. Also, very relevantly, bishop d5 is a huge threat, just picking up everything along the uh, the other light, uh, long diagonal. Uh, your pieces are just so poorly uh poorly coordinated that and despite being a piece up you are just not going to be able to preserve the the material balance uh and uh yeah white comes out white comes out ahead so yeah this is the one game i definitely wanted to show you and uh um for you know the the rest of the session let's call it call it like this Maybe some of you, you know, have something that you want to discuss because there's there's some games from the tournament I could show you snippets of. I could show you sort of uh, like a general idea of what happened in the World Cup uh, because that, well, uh, I mean, the, the Women's World Cup actually was decided today. So it's in terms of sporting achievements, it's definitely the biggest chess event that happened today uh, with all due respect to chessable masters. So... I'm I'm very open to suggestions. Uh, uh, if queen of four check, queen of four check is not playable here, right? Because uh, we can we can just take it. Uh, spiral. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I as, as as I mentioned, I I do have things prepared, but uh, I sort of lined up a little bit of everything, and there is there is no way uh, you know I can. 
I can show all of it, so we should probably pick a topic and stick to it. Uh, your thoughts on the end game between Duda and Carlson? Um, a very intriguing end game, which I did not analyze uh, in any kind of detail. I was doing live commentary with uh, with Jan Gustafsson uh, at the time, and we had the machine sort of running in the background, but not a very strong machine. Uh, and it seemed like uh, Magnus, from a certain moment on, I think he probably made some slight mistake to find himself in that situation. But once he got to the... I think I have the game. Hang on a second. Let me... Um, let me see if I actually have that game uh, loaded up. I might do. Yeah. Uh, we'll We'll just sort of completely gloss over uh, you know the the earlier part of the game because I think it's too long of a game for for for, for us to cover properly. But if we if we take uh, I don't know some position like this as a starting point, <clears throat> uh, the engine suggests that uh, um, white is a little bit better, but it probably should be a draw with precise play. And then uh, Duda made an inaccuracy somewhere here, like in this position, machine is very heavily in favor of the move knight g5 e4 instead of rook e1. And somewhere here, I was pretty sure that Magnus will make a draw without any kind of issues whatsoever. And then it felt to me, at least from his reaction, that maybe he thought this position is completely safe and maybe he will even get to push for a little bit. And then he got hit with rook e8, knight e5 and realized that the pawn f7 is about to drop. And uh, uh, he actually quite visibly had to refocus and uh, sort of restart the engine because clearly he did not uh, expect that to happen. He probably missed rookie 895, rookie 7 as a construction altogether. Uh, and the F7 pawn is dropping in most lines here. And he took a long, long time here on his next decision. And I think from that moment on, he defended really, really well. I think the machine agreed with uh, most of his decisions starting from this moment on and uh, he saved the game very convincingly. It wasn't it wasn't easy at all. It was at a certain point it became kind of scary, uh, but he uh, he defended well and uh, did make a draw. Um, so questions in chat. There's a lot. Uh, uh, there's a lot there. Um, uh, is there a reason Karakin does so well in the World Cup? Uh, a question from Class of seventy nine. Also, I am now. Uh, forcibly reminded that I have to give away socks. <laughs> this is a kind of a weird segue, but there are some socks to give away. Uh, and uh, um, I'm hoping that, uh, I mean, I've already sort of deleted that screen, but I assume we can go back and figure out who got Queen takes B7 correctly. Uh, so I guess everybody who played queen takes b7 and bishop takes d6, bishop takes d4 there uh, is eligible for socks if they want socks. There's also mugs, I think. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, socks are very meta. There's been some some very in interesting sock-related content on Twitter. So I'm 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 team socks personally. But uh, it's it's up to you. And uh, perhaps there will be. Uh, and possibly also t-shirts, but I'm not entirely sure. There's definitely socks and mugs were mentioned. I'm not the best at uh, at this giveaway stuff. I probably should have uh, inquired uh, more diligently as to exactly what's uh, <laughs> what's available. But my mind was so fixated on socks that uh, nothing else really filtered past. Are the socks autographed by you? No, no, they're not. Uh, Photographing anything these days, and particularly if it involves mailing, mailing things to Russia and then from Russia, is something you don't really want to even attempt. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, question, why, why do you think Karakin is doing so well in the World Cups? I think he is very, very stable psychologically. I think that, I mean, obviously it helps to be a very strong chess player, uh, which he is, but I think the biggest thing that probably separates him from most of uh, most of the rest is how well he uh, trained himself, or perhaps that's a natural gift that he just sort of enhanced 
with years of practice. Uh, how well he uh, he does dealing with with, with setbacks uh, because he you know over the course of his uh, World Cup victories, uh, obviously for me like the one I the one I know the most is the one where I lost the final to him after leading two zero in a four game match and needing one draw out of the last two games. I still have nightmares, uh, <clears throat> uh, but you know right in the run up. To that final, uh, he uh, lost the first game to Alexander Onishuk, I think maybe in round one or maybe round two of the World Cup. And then he lost in the semis to Pavel Elianov. Uh, so he probably has one of the, if not the best record in the world in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, winning on demand. In, in these types of uh, extreme high pressure, high stakes situations, very very few people I think can uh, can uh, rival his record. Um, I've I've done some of that myself over the course of my career. I've done okay in knockout events. I'm actually uh, I have a very decent World Cup record, but by this point, it would be absolutely you know delusional for me to claim that my record is as good as his. It's his, I think, fourth. No, it's his third final. Uh, it's staggering, considering how difficult those tournaments are. And they are, trust me, they are more difficult than they look. And they look difficult. Uh, a, a third final over the course of whatever it is, 13, 15 years, is an unbelievable achievement. It's, it's really, really stunning. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm full, of, uh, full of admiration for... Uh, for him and for yeah and uh, I, I don't know exactly how to react to people raising hands but uh, somebody raised the hand and then the raised hand disappeared if, if, if you have a question uh, uh, I, I everybody is muted but I really am not against the idea of you guys unmuting unmuting them uh, yourselves and asking questions in in voice um, so what else am I missing? Yeah, the, there was a Karakian question. Uh, uh, given the recent 1B3 boom, should we as Black be worried? Not particularly, no. <laughs> uh, I think we should welcome, uh, like if, if, the, uh, if the Ajiban course actually creates a ton of new 1B3 players. Uh, I mean, it's a tricky opening. I, Ajiban played me in the final of the Bander Blitz Cup group that we played in trying to qualify for the main. Uh, for the main top eight group, and he beat me playing exclusively one v three against me with white. So <laughs> I'm not going to claim it's unplayable. It would be would be ridiculous. But you know, compared to things you normally encounter with black, if there is suddenly a new generation of people which are going to be playing exclusively one v three against us, I would welcome it with open with open arms, uh, because I mean one v three as an opening ideologically is aimed at getting a playable position and playing chess, which is something that I've always been so happy to see as somebody, you know, playing the black pieces. If, you know, if, if my opponent is not attempting to just kill me stone dead out of the opening, I am so ecstatic. I, I like playing chess. Chess is my favorite game. If, you know, if people want to compete with me specifically in the skill of playing chess, bring it on. You know, c competing with people in the skill of preparing for specific openings, I am now very, very far behind the best in the world. Uh, when it comes to actually playing chess, I still enjoy it a great deal, and I still, you know, please do, please do. I'm, I'm extremely happy about that. Uh, what else am I missing in uh, uh, in chat? There was a question about specific strategies of playing for. Uh, for a win and a must win game, but I can't find it. Uh, there was something there. Like I, I sort of remember it was, uh, it was stated very, very uh, concretely though. So I, I want to, I want to find it. Uh, chess definitely isn't solved. Yeah, there's a, like a throwaway question if if chess is solved because more pe more and more people are playing one v three. No, chess isn't solved. It's a, it's a question of uh, a how much effort you're willing to put into, 
uh, being well prepared in the openings. And, you know, everybody answers that for themselves. You, you like, it's very, very personal. Uh, for me, it's becoming, you know, less and less exciting to uh, dedicate more and more time to this specific aspect of chess. But obviously, I am not as uh, uh, competitively minded, let's put it like this, as I used to be, even though, like, if you if you put me in the World Cup, as as I've just noticed, like I I, I played in this World Cup and uh, I suddenly realized I once again want to do extremely well in it, and uh, losing hurt me deeply, and I I sort of rediscovered the competitive juices I thought were somewhat dormant. But in general, I I play chess these days for enjoyment uh, more than for you know specific achievements, uh, and because of that. Studying openings is less fun for me, but once again, everybody has to decide for themselves. What do you think about World Cup and Grand Suisse being basically equal for the qualification for the candidates? Um, I haven't really given it too much thought. Uh, I very much like Grand Suisse as an idea. Uh, the fact that it gives two sports and the World Cup gives, gives two spots, maybe uh, is, you know, it's it's an interesting fact I honestly was just alerted to because uh, like as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, it will sound a little bit defeatist, but, uh, you know, the, the specific dream of becoming world champion is not really occupying my every waking hour anymore. Let's put it like this. And therefore, uh i you know it it's not of any particular paramount importance for me to study you know the potential pathway to the candidates and like pour over over you know regulations and form strong opinions on how many people should qualify from where it's really like if i end up now i probably don't really have a path to qualify anymore but if i end up qualifying i'm extremely happy but it's it's not something I obsess about. Um, will I play the Grand Suisse? It's it's unclear. There are some scheduling conflicts. As as silly as that sounds, I might end up not playing, which will be regrettable. But uh, such is life. <clears throat> uh, were you surprised of Kasenyuk's amazing performance in the World Cup? Surprise is strong, but I mean I I respect her as a chess player a great deal. She is a, she is a very sharp player. She is very very gifted tactically. She's also, I think, as we've seen in this particular World Cup, she's still extremely motivated to do well. Uh, both her and uh, uh, Garechkina uh, showed, like for me, unbelievable levels of stamina and uh, uh, and concentration. Like I, I can't spend this amount of time at the board. It's just physically impossible for me. They almost never left the board. Uh, neither of them. They they spent like ninety percent of the gameplay time. Uh, at the board, thinking very, uh, very uh, seriously about what they were doing. Uh, they're very dedicated professionals. But the way Garechkina was playing up to the final, I thought she starts as a favorite. Uh, and uh, actually, this is one of the things I also have uh, <laughs> loaded in the uh, loaded in the uh, uh, the, the database because basically, like, it's a bit simplistic, but Basically, the entire match was decided at a very in a very very short period of time during game one of the final, where uh, Gareshkin was playing a very very strong game, and then she didn't even have that little time. They got to this position, and uh, <clears throat> we could make once again. I I suspect many of you will know the answer, but we could make another quiz here because you know socks, obviously. Uh, let me let me actually uh, do that, and this will be probably just a, a, a one move quiz. I'll give you a minute. Some of you will know the answer, but it's a. Let's talk about this position before before I set you uh, before I set you the task of finding the best move. Let's talk about this position for a second. Um, White used to have a pawn on f2, which was just very very uh, recently uh, given up with check to start attacking the black king side. In fact, queen takes f2 here. If you ask the heartless machine, uh, the machine will say it's a decisive mistake. And if you want to prolong the suffering, you are supposed to play queen g6 here. 
Uh, but uh, Alexander played queen takes f2, king h2, queen c2. Of course, the queen should not be allowed to return to like g6 or f5. So e4 was played, uh, uh, and black played h6. And uh, we get to this position where um, black has this knight of bishop on a6, which really isn't doing very much at all. Uh, black has a very weakened king. Uh, but for now, the bishop on g2 really is pinned, not participating in the attack. Uh, the king on h2 is also not entirely safe. In some positions, you might have to think about rook f2 things. Um, and uh, uh, there is a way for white here to uh, absolutely guarantee uh, winning the game. But really, only one move absolutely nails uh, nails that, uh, that task. And uh, uh, I'll give you a minute to... <clears throat> to name uh to name that move let me set it back to a minute and uh there we go uh and while while you're doing that i'll i'll answer some more questions from chat um uh were you coached by dvoretsky not personally i uh, I was at the two sessions of the Dvoretsky chess school, but I was never like a personal, personal pupil of his. We were on very, very good terms. Uh, I knew uh, the people who, di who he did teach quite well, like uh, Vadim Zvegensev is one of my earliest friends and colleagues. Uh, but I was never uh, personally coached by him, but I, I had the absolute, you know, the utmost respect for him. He was... Uh, a fantastic coach and also a very, very uh, a good person. He was he was kind and respectful and and smart. And uh, in those two sessions, uh, I I spent at the Dvoretsky School. Uh, you know the the conversations I've had with him, not personal. Like he would sometimes like invite pupils uh, for walks and just talk to us about life. And those conversations I perhaps remember better than some of the lessons like purely chess lessons that were there. Uh, and yeah, lots of you got this right. Once again, uh, congratulations. This is a long list of people who won socks. Uh, Chessable Masters, uh, Abdallah won, uh, Shaq Masteo won, Maurizio Matteoli, uh, Supremo, Capybar, Nightmare uh, 1412, JK 182, Chessman 1234, uh, Chira Jabus Rex, that's a good username, uh, Giggling Squid, uh, Nihilistic, uh, Roof Runner, uh, Super Fluty, uh, Chernev fan, uh, uh, Iali, and Papa Bear. And yeah, the answer here, I was kind of trying not to spell out what you're supposed to do here, but you guys, you guys figured it out. I, I was going on about, you know, the attackers we have and the attackers we don't have. We would very much like to uh, include the Bishop on G2 into the attack, but it's pinned and it's very difficult. Uh, and the piece I did not mention at all because I thought it would be like a dead giveaway, is the rook on e1, which is currently not really doing very much. But if you imagine it participating in the attack, it probably just ends the game on the spot because black just will not have enough defenders. And the move rook d1 here just ends the game on the spot because there's really no defense against either rook d6 or rook d7. Probably the most, like the cutest line here uh, that I can show you is, goes like queen c3, we go rook d6, creating a threat of rook takes h6, which will be mate. And if black plays rook f6, the, li the way I like to finish the game here is the move uh, e4. It's not the only move that wins, but the one I like the most is the move e5, uh, attacking the rook and kind of creating an overloading situation where if black takes on d6, uh, we can uh, swoop in and play queen e8 and queen takes f8 mate because the rook is no longer on the f file. Uh, and if you take... Uh, on e5, we can now go back to giving this check, and then uh, we can pick up the uh, the queen, which we lured to to its demise. So yeah, rook d1, uh, rook d1 is a uh, an immediate solution here, and also like honorable mention has to go to Klaza 79 and uh, uh, Zutnoche because uh, <clears throat> the move knight e6, uh, although not the best move in the position, is actually far and away the second best. And is also winning. It's just not winning as quickly as as Rook D1 is. <clears throat> um, do you think Carlson is playing many opening lines in the in the World Cup to not reveal prep? To, no, I I think this entire 
uh, this entire, um, what's the word, narrative is uh, hugely, hugely uh, overstated. It's like it's become, you know, part of the lore. People not playing good openings because they don't want to show what they're looking at for the world for, for the world championship. World Cup is hugely important. Like Magnus would not be playing it if he didn't really, really, really want to win it. Uh, he he, I think, is on the record saying that he really enjoys World Cups, thinks they're great fun and arguably the the most exciting tournament to be playing and to be watching. And he is, I, I think, very obviously tryharding like hell in this one. And it just makes no sense whatsoever, you know, giving those priors. I think this is what we have to assume. Uh, it makes no sense at all to to be playing random openings. Uh, plus, <clears throat> you know, the current situation with topical openings, which is what you normally expect to be played in a world championship match, is that there is a group of players comprised of, like, sort of the entirety of the top 10, for instance, plus you know, most of the people who are aspiring to be in the top 10. Uh, everybody is basically looking at the same things, using the same engines. So it's extremely likely that more than one per at any given time, it's extremely likely that more than one person is aware of an extremely important novelty in an extremely topical line. So if in a tournament like the World Cup, you get an opportunity to play that and you don't, you can tell yourself that you're saving something for the world championship match. What will in most, in, you know, in, in all likelihood, what will actually happen is somebody else will play it in the next big tournament that happens in the calendar. And the idea will still be shown to the entire world, but you didn't win a game in a hugely important tournament you care about. So that just doesn't make any sense in the current climate. I think, you know, when I spoke to my most important coach, my, uh, like, not my first coach, but the coach who gave me the most, who, like, made me the chess player that I am, who was actually, I think, maybe today or yesterday, honored by FIDE. He is uh, on the list of uh, the, the the veterans who are going to get some support from FIDE for their sort of lifetime achievement, uh, Andre Lukin, uh, he told me a lot of stories about you know how chess was played in his time. He he is like maybe twenty years older than I am, and uh, in the pre pre internet era, you absolutely could like uh, hoard novelties because information was passed around so slowly that you know you could play an opening for like half a year and nobody would notice because like there's no access to the games you play let's say in domestic competitions uh if you don't send them to the informant yourself nobody will know and like if, if you're playing in soviet tournaments there used to be a publication called chess bulletin which would just publish lots of current games without annotations so some of them will get published somewhere, but Western players, for instance, don't necessarily speak Russian, don't necessarily want to subscribe to an obscure Russian publication to get access to some weird games. So yeah, in, 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 in that climate, you can definitely uh, you know, have an idea and wait for the most important tournament of your calendar that year to play it. But these days, yeah, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so, we should be sort of uh, uh, slowly preparing to wrap up. So I'll take a few more questions and uh, uh, and then I'll probably bid you, bid you adieu because I'm, I'm, ru I'm running out of vocal cords if I'm, if I'm entirely honest. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I asked earlier about on-demand strategy for defensive side in the context of Karek and Shankland and what happened there. I don't think what Sam was doing was wrong. If we're talking about classical, I don't know if I like him playing that Nidorf in uh, both rapid games in particular. Playing it once, because he, I think he got a decent position in the first one. It kind of deteriorated very quickly, but I think from the beginning uh, it was okay. But repeating, like, I can also maybe bring it up to the, bring it on the board. Like, in the in the Karakin-Shanklin match, I assume you can still see me moving pieces on the board, right? 
So he played he played the knight of twice, and uh, uh, Karakin actually plays h3 a great deal here as his I think these days main choice weapon. Uh, there's also bishop g5, but bishop g5 there are so many theoretical lines which are supposedly uh, a force draw that uh, uh, I think h3 was he had every right to expect h3 to happen. And Sam twice played, uh, I think he went uh, knight c6, g4, g6, right? Bishop e3, knight takes d4, with the intention of meeting bishop takes d4 with bishop h6. Uh, so Perkin played queen takes d4, bishop g7, and he played, in the first one he played castles here, and in the second one he surprised Sam by a very, very <clears throat> interesting strategic pawn sacrifice. He went e5, knight d7. Castles long, bishop takes e5 and queen d2, which is actually very, very striking because we've given up a, a central pawn basically to finish development, to slightly hinder black from finishing their development, and to open some diagonals and some files in the center. Uh, and uh, Sam basically made one inaccuracy in that game. I think he played queen a5, and after knight d5, uh, faced with an opponent who was blitzing all of this out, he decided not to engage with queen takes a2, which I think is the right move in this position. Uh, he took on d2 and played rook b8, and after, I think, f4, bishop g7, bishop g2, uh, uh, he was more or less busted and went on to lose. Uh, so I don't know about repeating the same line, but playing that, same, playing that line um, uh, in game uh, four of the match, I think, is fine. And also what he played in the second classical when he needed a draw, I think it's also completely fine. It's just that, yeah, I was <laughs> I was wondering which Sasha you meant, Igloo Kid. I am reading some of the Twitch messages. Not, uh, I'm I'm more reading the the internal chat than I am reading the the Twitch chat. But I do have the Twitch chat open. Um. Uh. What happened in the classical is, uh, Sam played the French, which I don't think necessarily could have been predicted, which already is a good start. And then uh, Sergei played the least theoretical of the replies to the French. And Sam, you know, instead of trying to kind of make the position as simple as possible uh, right out of the opening, he went for the line he knew was good for black, uh, got a very decent playable position, and then got outplayed uh, because Karakin is a very strong player and he doesn't forgive even slight mistakes. And this can happen, but I don't think... Like the classical, I don't think there is any blame that you could attach to the opening choice here at all. Maybe repeating this neither was a bit optimistic. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the classical is fine. Um, and uh, yeah, some, some, more, uh, some more questions. And we, we should be wrapping up because we are rating somebody else. I'll, I'll take maybe, yeah, if, if I can see one more. Uh, uh, one more question. Yeah, people asking about Grunfeld Part Two later this year. I hope I, I I have less free time than I sort of expected to have uh, this year, so it's progressing slower than I wanted, but it is progressing. Um, hang on. Uh, advice for converting an advantage like an Artemiev Hare Krishna. Yeah, I would need to bring that up on the board and talk about it. I think Artemiev did a very good job, but in general, uh, just sort of calculating cleanly will, you know, go a long way in positions like that. I understand it's a kind of a very, you know, general get good type of answer, which I dislike myself, but uh, it still it still is true. Uh, all right. Since uh, since I'm I'm being told by admins that we uh, we have to pass the raid on. Uh, thanks all of you. Thanks all of you for participating. Uh, I hope I made at least some sense. I I never really know how much sense I'm making when I do this. And uh, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. And uh, there might be more of these in the future.